Hello there. Welcome to this episode of Just the Dis. My name is Brian, and we talk about Blu-rays here. And for this episode, we are talking about imprint films again. Imprint films, of course, as I've said before, a uh, division of Via Vision Entertainment from Australia. But they have really done a heck of a job carving out their own niche as a wonderful, uh, you know, new-ish boutique label. Uh, I am going to be talking about their February 2022 offerings, their package for February 2022, which is um, very comedic. It's all pretty much all comedy here. Although, well, we'll get into that in a second, but um, we've got some Jack Lemmon appearances. We've got some Jerry Lewis. We've got more stuff, some more iconic stuff. Um, we'll get to that. Let's start with one of my favorites, probably my favorite film in this whole bunch, and that's The Out-of-Towners, the 1970 uh, film directed by Arthur Hiller from a screenplay by Neil Simon. And of course, as you can see, it stars Jack Lemmon and Sandy Dennis, and it is a pretty... I was going to say it's a pretty great comedy, which it is, but it's also got a lot of um, anxiety and just nerves about it. And that has to do with the Jack Lemmon character, who is just a very anxious and, I mean, honestly, pretty obnoxious character. Uh, There's a lot of charisma that Jack Lemmon brings to a role like this, and I think that helps, but... You know, there's going to be people who watch this movie and just think he is awful, you know, because the idea is basically you have a couple from, I think, Ohio traveling to New York City, and it's about a job interview that the Jack Lemmon character has, and they are very, well, at least Lemmon's character is very excited about New York, and he believes that Sandy Dennis is also excited about it, her character, his wife, Um, but they just keep running into one problem after another you know uh it's like the pre planes trains and automobiles film before that you know um so they're flying to new york they decide not to eat dinner on the plane because they have an 8 30 dinner reservation and then the plane ends up having some issues and is circling new york uh for hours and they're starving and uh then they finally get there and you know they're problems getting their luggage and you know there's just ongoing it's a disaster movie of sorts we put this on pure cinema Elric and I did a disaster movie episode and we had one category it was a sampler so we had all these different categories one category was uh personal disaster and that's what this is it's just uh this comedy but also not you know like we've all had these issues when you travel things go wrong you know flights are late flights get delayed and it sets off a chain of events and anyway so it's fascinating to watch this I think it's very funny in in parts certainly uh it's a great script by Neil Simon apparently was originally part of Plaza Suite the play Plaza Suite like which is already um several different stories if I recall and it was uh, one that he wanted to incorporate into Plaza Suite, but then I think Neil, I think, um, I can't remember, was it Mike Nichols that was directing? I can't remember, the play. Um, and it was like, it's too much. We've got too much going on here. So he just took that piece and sort of worked it and developed it into this screenplay. And yeah, it's just a great, you know, uh, you know, anxiety inducing comedy uh, all about you know, and just to see where they end up, you know, when they're, well, I don't want to give away too much, but they end up not having the hotel room they wanted. And that's putting it, you know, lightly. Um, and things are just crazy. They're just exhausted by the end of this. And, um, so I don't know, but the Jack Lemmon character is constantly running around and being pretty persnickety and kind of demanding and a little rude to say the least to all kinds of service people across, all kinds of different uh, areas, you know, from a, a flight attendant to a, um, 
guy who works at the baggage claim, played by Billy D. Williams, uh, on down the line. Um, and and there's a great supporting cast of bit parts here. You have like like I said, Billy D. Williams, Dolph Sweet, Ann Mira, Paul Dooley. I can't remember if he's a hotel guy or what, but he's got a great bit. Uh, Ann Prentice is um the uh, the um, flight attendant on their plane. And, um, and by the way, um, this has a nice commentary track from Lee Gambin, who's done several commentary tracks for, for imprint films and others. And uh, very nice track. Uh, and one thing he does at the beginning when we're seeing Ann Princess on film is he talks briefly about her sad story, which I didn't know, which, you know, that she she's, of course, the sister of Paula Prentice, uh, the less successful sister of Paula Prentice, who you know, had some success in the 60s, uh, had a TV show, I think then. And then I think her career didn't quite take off in the same way as Paula's. And I don't know what happened, but basically she ends up in the late 90s uh, going to jail for assaulting her 80-year-old dad. And then while she was being held for that crime, she tried to make arrangements with another inmate to uh, have this person murder her brother-in-law uh richard benjamin her nephew their son this is paula prentice's husband and son and her dad and so she was sent uh up for 19 years for this further conspiracy to commit murder and died in prison very sad and i had no idea and she you know looks a lot like paula and i'd seen her in some other movies but i really had no clue that was the story anyway just one of the little tidbits that comes up in the commentary track but um so this is a debut on Blu-ray, I believe, for this film. But it is, you know, uh, it is a you know a big one for Paramount in a lot of ways. So my guess, if I had to guess, would be that you know at some point Paramount's probably going to put this one out on a domestic Blu-ray. Although, you know, I I say it on every episode, but I should say it at the top. Each one of these discs has been tested in my U.S. Region A player, and they've all played fine. Uh, they're not marked with any region, but uh, they're all region free as far as I can tell. So anyway, this one may come out. I don't have any specific uh, information that that's happening, but it's just a high profile enough comedy for Paramount that I'm assuming it will get stateside treatment based on the way Paramount's been cranking stuff out. So you might get this stateside if you don't want to, if you don't feel like picking this one up. But uh, for me, again, one of my favorites from this group um, and well worth uh, getting. That is the Out of Towners. Next, we have the Bad News Bears in Breaking Training from 1977. Um, I should say, you know, Out of Towners is a pretty ultimately dark comedy, uh, and Bad News Bears in Breaking Training, quite the opposite. Uh, very light in its comedy, and. Um, you know, a very interesting follow-up to, uh, they of course did, Imprint already did the Bad News Bears, which of course then did get a Paramount uh, Blu-ray release stateside. Um, but this can go right up next to your Bad News Bears from Imprint, if you want. Um, so this sequel comes out in 1977, is directed by Michael Pressman, who had done, as far as I know, I think he'd only done The Great Texas Dynamite Chase for Corman. And then uh, got this gig. And um, there's a really nice commentary track on this. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but basically, the difference between the first and second movie, uh, you, you got a complete shift of focus. Whereas in Bad News Bears, the focus and the heart of the movie, I think, is Walter Matthau and Tatum O'Neill's relationship and neither of them are in this movie. So this is more the story of the Bears. Um, and it's a story of how, you know, they are California champs and they got invited to play at the Houston Astrodome. But they need a new coach. And Dolph Sweet shows up again here at the beginning as their grumpy new coach. And they completely bail on him. And Kelly Leak, played by, um, of course... Uh, Oh boy, why am I always forgetting everything? Um, I'll get I'll get to that in a second. Um, 
Jackie O'Haley, uh, you know, gets a van for them and gets them a new pitcher. And, you know, they set up this whole ruse to go down to the Houston Astrodome without a chaperone. They, they find like a greenskeeper that can barely speak um, to pretend that he's their coach. And then they tell all their parents he's taking them down and they go. So they get down there and it becomes like this fun sort of goofy kitty kitty in the sense of like it gets a little scatological and and raunchy um road comedy right um but it really shifts into gear no pun intended uh when they get to houston and they suddenly uh are caught by lane smith who's one of the supporting actors uh clifton james shows up here i love clifton james uh and lane smith uh shows up and catches them in this hotel room which they've you know, surreptitiously checked into. And he says, get your coach now. Kelly Leak, uh, Jackie Rohilly, gets a hold of his dad, his estranged father, played by William Devane, who's really great in this, and sort of takes over as the coach of the team. At first, it seems like it's just going to be like, dad can just show up and do this. And then he actually starts coaching them. And it's fun because in the commentary, Michael Pressman talks about how he wasn't sure about um, uh, Bill Devane's background with baseball, but he may have played in the minor leagues or he, he was a ball player. Like he was really into it. And um, so there's some fun stuff with him just coaching the team. Um, but anyway, so you've got a lot of the Bears actually returning to this movie, a lot of the same actors, minus um, Engelberg. Because apparently, at least one explanation is that that actor, between the time of the first movie and this one, lost like 30 pounds. And apparently, they decided that part of the humor of that character was his weight. And a lot of it, there's a lot of comments about his weight, maybe a little too much, um, in the film. And so they just recast that character. Um, But you have a lot of the others, the rest of the team is almost identical to the bears in the first movie. So that's cool. You have those returning kids now older. Um, But yeah, it's really about when William Devane joins in, you really get the movie really shifts up and becomes a bad news bears movie in that way. And um, yeah, so I really enjoy this one. It's underseen and under talked about. Uh, It has two commentary tracks. Um, The first, as I mentioned, has um, director Michael Pressman moderated by Gillian uh, Wallace Horvitt. And it's a nice track. He has a lot of, you know, fond recollections of the movie, a lot of good stories, and a lot of um, talk of how he let the kids improvise. And so a lot of, he shot a lot of the scenes very wide and would let the kids just kind of do their thing, do several takes. Same thing with Bill Devane. He'd let him improvise. And so that's kind of cool. It gives the movie a different, feeling in some ways than the first um and it's got uh jimmy bayo as carmen ronzani as the kid who comes in to replace tatum o'neill uh very interesting character very kind of goofy in some ways um but nonetheless uh good movie and uh i think this is its first time on blu-ray but you know we'll probably see it from paramount i would imagine maybe we'll see um but so this is uh what it looks like so that is the bad news bears in breaking training then we got some box sets box sets from imprint are always fun we have first jerry lewis at columbia and this has jerry in red and black on the back um and this is two of his i think lesser seen films from the late 60s um and it's a thing where you know i love jerry lewis i'm a big fan of him and i think a lot of people have a certain impression of him because of the telethon stuff and the later era jerry which is you know he could be a little bit he could be a little much like he could be a little pompous and full of himself and i think that could potentially overshadow uh, somebody's desire to want to go back and see his, uh, his, not only his Martin and Lewis stuff, which is good, but his solo stuff where he's directing at Paramount, starting with the bellboy, moving into the ladies man, which I think is a, just a masterpiece. 
and is on par with Rear Window in terms of one of the greatest sets ever made in, for a movie. Anyway, uh, so I love Jerry in that period where he's writing and directing and co-writing with Bill Richmond, who is involved in one of these films, and just really doing good stuff. And this is Jerry, I don't want to say in the decline, but I guess one thing that comes out in one of the great commentary tracks here is that, you know, Jerry is starting to see his films cost more money and his films make less money as we get later into the 60s. He kind of seems to rule the early to middle 60s. And then late 60s, he's starting to wane a bit in his popularity, it seems, at least with young people. And I'll get to that in a second. But, um, okay, so you have this wonderful box set. It has the um, little topper on it. And then we have The Big Mouth from 1967 and Hook, Line, and Sinker from 1969. We'll start with The Big Mouth. Now, this one is really kind of neat for Jerry fans because it is produced and directed by Jerry, co-written by Bill Richmond, which is the lineage of a lot of the, you know, like Nutty Professor and and stuff like that. Uh, and in fact, Jerry even does a bit as you know, his kelp character from the Nutty Professor, kind of more. I mean, he's literally the same makeup. He, anyway, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but so Big Mouth is one that I don't think has been really widely available uh, on home video much. I could be wrong about that. Maybe there's a DVD, but I don't think so. Um, I just remember this one was really hard to see for a long time. And I know that Hook, Line, and Sinker uh, apparently has a Jerry Lewis triple feature DVD that Mill Creek put out as part of some Columbia movies, some other Columbia movies, which way to the front, some other stuff like that. Um, but this one, I just don't remember it being really widely available. I remember it was really hard to see. There was maybe a VHS, but I feel like I had to watch like a TV rip. Anyway, um, is it Jerry's best stuff? No, I'll be honest. It's not, but I still think it's interesting. I still think it's funny if you like Jerry's stuff. Um, it's about uh, Jerry plays like a bookkeeper who ends up hooking this. He's fishing on the beach and he pulls in this body and it ends up being this like uh, criminal who smuggled diamonds and there's like a map to the diamonds. It's like this whole convoluted plot where they he looks just like the criminal guy which is another classic Jerry thing where he plays multiple characters in a movie that he did that a lot. Um, but in this case, he looks literally like this criminal and the, the mob folks that are after him, the, the criminal now are after this bookkeeper guy and <clears throat> kind of spins out from there. But uh, it's interesting. You know, it's interesting. I, I do think this has actually got one of my favorite commentaries in all this whole group. And it's by, uh, author and film historian and curator Justin Humphreys. Um, and he th seems like a really sharp guy uh, who knows a lot about Jerry Lewis, a big Jerry Lewis fan, and he makes a lot of great points about Jerry and his career at this time because he's talking about um, how, again, like Jerry's movies are seeming to wane in popularity. And he mentions things like, this is the 1967, this is the year of like the Wild Angels and like Blow Up, you know, like these are the movies that are really um, capturing the imagination and attention of young people of this period. And Jerry, as he says, is maybe not hip anymore. And, you know, he mentions that Jerry um, got addicted to painkillers after uh, an accident in 1965. And he thinks that might have contributed to some things I think it was there's just a there's a whole lot of factors involved in where Jerry's at here and I think that alone is fascinating he's he's been hugely successful he's got a very healthy ego about it and his abilities as both a filmmaker and a comedic uh presence and I think as this guy says in the commentary Jerry's maybe getting a little bit lazy and he's recycling gags he's recycling characters he's taking too long on certain gags you know, he's just indulging and, you know, so he goes from Paramount where he's seeing, you know, this decline in the money. I don't know if they showed him the door or if he, le he just decides to leave. 
Uh, but Columbia is a cheaper studio, so the films don't look quite as good as they did at Paramount. Although I think this transfer looks really nice. Um, although, if I have any complaints about this commentary, I would say that Humphreys maybe criticizes the film a little too much, even though I can tell he likes Jerry and he likes even this movie, parts of it. Um, but he's criticizing the production design and all this stuff. You know, this looks like a Batman episode, things like that. And I, while I don't totally disagree, I think that maybe there's a little too much of that in this. But he does make some really fair points and some stuff that I hadn't really thought about. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's exactly what was happening in terms of Jerry at this time. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting movie and, like I said, a rare one. So if you're a Jerry fan, this is a big deal to get this on Blu-ray finally. Um, this also includes the Super 8 version of the film, TV spots, textless opening, isolated audio track, effects track. Um, so that's the big mouth. Okay. Then we have Hook, Line, and Sinker. This is from 1969. This is directed by George Marshall, as opposed to Jerry. Um, it is written by Rod Amato. Now, you may not be familiar with that name, but <laughs> I have to say I'm a fan of Rod Amato. Um, he directed a little movie called Drive-In in 1976, which is a cult item in which desperately needs a Blu-ray, uh, but is a wonderful, almost Altman-esque comedy about this little drive-in theater in the South and kind of all the this small town and these personalities that are uh, these characters in this town it's it's great i'm a huge drive-in fan big big fan of that film uh and then he would go on to do like high school usa with michael j fox and nancy mckeon uh he did love lines uh which is a great um comedy with michael winslow about uh he runs a company that has these um a company that has like these phone setups so you can have this is before cell phones, obviously, so you can have, like, conference calls, and he, it's high school rival. Anyway, I'm getting, I don't want to get carried away on love lines here. We're way off the map. Anyway, so Rod Amato is a writer on this, um, which, you know, he ain't no Jerry Lewis. We'll put it like that. Um, this one is really interesting because it's all about an insurance salesman played by Jerry Lewis who's married to Anne Francis. He has two kids. Uh, he is a big fisherman. So there's fishing in both of these movies. Um, and he is at a point where the movie sort of opens with um, him in sort of that domestic, 60s domestic comedy stuff. He's at home, you know, he's trying to fix things around the house. Uh, you know, the sink gets clogged up and he's plunging it and he pulls the whole sink out of the, the counter, you know. Or he's trying to watch TV and his kids are flipping the remote on him. Or he's trying to paint the house and the kids knock over the ladder and spills paint on him. Or he's trying to um, plant some roses in his garden and this really fake-looking gopher comes up out of the ground and he ends up trying to spray him and gets sprayed in the face, you know. So it's pretty broad stuff. And that's the beginning of the movie. And then he goes to see his doctor, played by Peter Lawford, and he tells him he's got this rare, I think, heart condition and he's going to die and it becomes like not Joe versus the volcano exactly, but it's like his wife tells him, you know, why don't you just, you've got this $150,000 life, life insurance policy. Why don't you just go, uh, and you know, go crazy, go on a big fishing trip, make it look like you abandoned us and hopefully they won't come after us for the money. And, you know, just have a good time in this last few months of your life. Very interesting take. Um, so he does that. Um, but then there's some complications with that. And, and I don't want to talk about exactly what happens, but it doesn't go exactly like that idea of how it should go. And there's some sort of twists and turns to it. Uh, so it gets goofier and more um, silly in the back. Well, it's silly throughout, honestly. Um, but yeah, so... Again, this one was relatively rare, although that DVD was available, but this is, I think, the Blu-ray premiere. Um, this has an audio commentary by Peter Tunguette uh, and a full episode of Dick, the Dick Cavett Show with Jerry, recorded in 1972, and same kind of stuff as the other one. But um, but I like, you know, there's not enough Jerry Lewis on Blu-ray. 
I'll be honest, you know, the Paramount stuff, I'm hoping that, again, to come back to Paramount, which is a studio that um, Imprint has worked with a lot, and then, of course, we've seen a lot of stateside releases from Paramount and Paramount Presents and all that. I'm hoping that between Imprint Films and Paramount themselves, we can actually get, I think The Nutty Professor is the big one that's on Blu-ray of his 60s films, but The Bellboy's not on Blu-ray, Ladies' Man's not on Blu-ray, um, Disorderly, Orderly, all that stuff from the 60s that I think is pretty fun. Um, Family Jewels is fun. Um, Cinderfella, none of these are on Blu-ray. And some would say that we're better for that, but I, you know, I think that they should be considering how good some of them are. I think you watch The Bellboy and The Ladies' Man and you don't think Jerry's got something. I don't know what to tell you. I really just think as a director and a comedic voice, he really finds his way in those early directorial efforts. And anyway, so this is later Jerry and I am just glad to have it, you know, ultimately. So uh, that is Jerry Lewis at Columbia box set. Then we have a really nice box set of the Odd Couple collection. And this one is really neat because it is not only the movies, so you get, um, okay, let's open it up. Same kind of deal. You've got a nice box. And um, so what, I'm just going to go through what you get first, okay? So you get The Odd Couple, the original film from 1968. You get The Odd Couple 2 from 1998, 30 years later. And then you get The Odd Couple on television, classic episodes. So in these, of course, you have Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon playing Oscar Madison and Felix Unger. Uh, and then in this, of course, you have Jack Klugman and Tony Randall in the TV version. Now, this isn't a complete series it's uh one two three four five six seven eight nine this looks like about 10 episodes of the show but i think it's a neat thing that they've included all this plus some extra stuff we'll get to that in a minute but let's start with the original okay um it is one of the great pairings of all time i mean these two actors are just so good together you know, Felix Unger, the uptight, uh, type A sort of dude, and Oscar Madison, the slob, uh, laid back jokester, ladies man type, and they end up living together. They've been friends, they have a card game, but they end up living together. This is, of course, Neil Simon returning. This is based on um, his play. He wrote the screenplay. Uh, directed by Gene Sachs, who I have a lot of respect for after re-watching this. I don't, I don't think he did a ton of films, but he does a really nice job of shooting things wide. Again, back to the breaking training idea, shooting things wide and letting the actors move around the frame, but also knowing, I don't know, it just, it just really works. Um, music by Neil Hefty, who did, uh, you know, Batman music, just really great jazzy score, that classic theme that you hear it and you know it right away. Um, but yeah, just a really wonderfully written character piece so much great comedy between these two actors and they just are dynamite together and uh i learned a lot uh from even just the one commentary track there's there's two here but the one that i really love is charlie mathow and chris lemon so the sons of both of these actors they're talking about their dads they obviously know each other because their dads were friends for years and they have a great rapport, and they just have fun. It's a little slow to start, but once they get into it, they have a lot of great stories. They just, you know, like Chris Lemon will tell Charlie a story that um, Mathau told him, and vice versa. They have stories about each other's dads, and there's so many good ones uh, throughout. But one of the things that, you, that I didn't really realize, and it's obvious if you know anything about this stuff, is that Mathau, of course, played Oscar Madison on stage, and apparently played with Art Carney as Felix Unger. And so he originated the character on stage, and did it for years or whatever, and then Paramount wanted to make the movie, and they were going to cast Jackie Gleason and Frank Sinatra, and I don't know who was going to be who. But apparently Matha went to the head of uh, Paramount, uh, was it Howard Koch, and said, do you want to be the guy that ruins the odd couple? 
And that was enough to get Koch to cast him. And then they get Lemon. And once you see these two together, Art Carney's a favorite of mine. And I'm sure that the two of them together were outstanding. Like Matthau and, and Carney were outstanding. But, but Lemon and Matthau are just one of the great duos of cinema of all time. And they are so good in this movie. And I forgot. Like, this is actually... I like the TV show, but I think it overshadowed the movies for me. And I, I just somehow lost interest in these characters. But rewatching it again, I was just like, man, this is just... A, it's a masterclass in acting from two guys who aren't even... Like, they're they're doing what they do, but they make it seem so effortless. And they're so funny together. And Jack Lemmon is so physical and so uptight. And so much of the comedy derives from... Mathau's reactions to Jack Lemmon, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, this commentary with the two uh, sons is just delightful. Just delightful stuff. Um, you know, there's a story Mathau said, I guess, he didn't want to play Oscar Madison initially in the play because he's like, this is too much like my personality. Uh, it's not enough of a challenge. And he told Neil Simon this, and Neil said, do me a favor. Uh, act on your own time, meaning (laughs) you can play this character that's more or less you and that'll be fine. Um, I like that stuff. But there's so many good little stories. Like uh, apparently Mathau was a really solid card player and his favorite game was Texas Hold'em. And Chris Lemon said his dad's favorite game, Jack Lemon's favorite card game was Go Fish. Um, Just silly little asides like that. So anyway, um, really great movie. Looks good on this transfer. And there's another commentary track here from uh, film historians Nathaniel Thompson and Howard S. Berger. And then you have In the Beginning featurette, Matho and Lemon, Lemon and Matho featurette, Memories from Set featurette, Inside the Odd Couple featurette, and Odd Couple of Classic featurette, as well as an isolated track with that Neil Hefty score, which is great. Then you have The Odd Couple 2, 30 Years Later, directed by Howard Deutsch, who did Some Kind of Wonderful and uh, uh, Pretty in Pink. And... Um, I can't remember this movie. I'm looking forward to rewatching this. Um, I do think it's interesting to revisit two iconic characters 30 years later. Um, and so anyway, uh, audio commentary with film historian Scott Harrison, two grumpy men uh, directing The Odd Couple 2, interview with Howard Deutsch, brand new, promotional interviews with Lemon, Mathau, Gene Smart, writer Neil Simon, of course, Neil Simon back to write. Uh, Alan Silvestri does the music here. Um, Jack Lemmon, America's Everyman, 1996 documentary, and Walter Matthau, Diamond in the Rough, 1997 documentary. So you get these really cool documentary extras on this one. This is just a really nice set. Uh, and then, of course, the TV uh, episodes. Like I said, you get 10 of them here. The Breakup, They Use Horseradish, Don't They, Sleepwalker, The Fat Farm, Security Arms, Password, I Gotta Be Me, Take My Furniture, Please, The Odd Decathlon, and The Bigger They Are. So these are all over the looks like we have season one, two, three, four, and five episodes, you know, from those different seasons. Then we have audio commentary by series executive producer Gary Marshall on They Use Horseradish, Don't They? Two series promos, Gag Reel uh, with audio uh, introduction by Gary Marshall, and opening titles without narration and isolated uh, effects uh, score. So a nice um, odd couple set that we didn't know we wanted. But we do. Uh, so that's wonderful. And then closing out this round, we have, uh, you know, a series that was definitely important to me as a kid, and that's the Pink Panther series. We have the return of the Pink Panther with, of course, Peter Sellers reprising his, again, iconic comedic role as Inspector Clouseau. Uh, this is the technically the fourth Clouseau film. So you have... The Pink Panther, then you have A Shot in the Dark, then you have the very much lesser seen and talked about Inspector Clouseau, where you have Alan Arkin coming in and playing Clouseau, and that's in like 68, Uh, so it's like Shot in the Dark is in 64, Inspector Clouseau is in 68, and then we have, you know, Blake Edwards is involved in the first two films, and then he and Peter Sellers are reunited in this film, now 11 years after a shot in the dark. So it's technically the fourth, but sort of the third Pink Panther movie. And um, it's really when I think the Clouseau becomes the Clouseau that we know, or that I think a lot of people are familiar with. Because I think the 70s, there's two entries in the 70s and the third one, there's more, but 
with with Peter Sellers uh, in the 80s. So you have the two 70s ones that I think were on cable a lot. And so I think a lot of people know this Clouseau, who's a little bigger, a little more goofy, definitely more in the center of the movie. I mean, even a shot, it, it really progressed. Like Pink Panther doesn't have that much Clouseau. Um, he's a side character, but then in Shot in the Dark, they make him more of a prominent character, but he really takes over the movie. I mean, he he's pretty much taking over in Shot in the Dark, but in Return and Strikes Again, I think, is where they really make him the center of the movie, and it's all about him and his frustrating antics for Herbert Lom, his boss, and yeah, just a real iconic character, for sure. Um, so this one has been available as part of this Pink Panther box set, which is now out of print from Shout Select, which has, you know, um, all the Sellers films uh, in it. Great box set, by the way. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping this is the beginnings of imprint putting out all of them, but, you know, we'll see. Um, uh, so anyway... Uh, this is a fun one. You know, this is a fun one. It opens with a great heist scene where the Pink Panther diamond is stolen. They're kind of rebooting the opening credits with the cartoon. And it's it's a lot of fun. Another iconic score, this time by Henry Mancini. Just, he beefs up his original theme for this. And yeah, it's just got some great bits. It's got Christopher Plummer uh, and of course Herbert Lom. Uh, when the world's most famous diamond, the Pink Panther, is stolen from its resting place at the Lugash National Museum. Who better to investigate than the man who recovered it the last time? Inspector Jacques Clouseau. Um, so yeah, it's just, you know, him being goofy, him investigating poorly, him asking dumb questions, him falling down a lot, and it's all very, very funny. Um, but, you know, this is another one that has a really nice commentary track. Uh, Jason Simos. Simos. God, I'm mispronouncing that name. I'm so sorry. Um, but he's from the Peter Sellers Appreciation Society. And this is another track that I just felt was really well put together and from somebody who really knows like what they're talking about. Like He really just goes through the movie and talks about the score. He talks about the actors. He talks about the context of when this is coming out. And it's great. Uh, just a really solid uh, commentary track and a really fun uh, movie. So um, anyway... That is it for this month's, um, the February releases from Imprint. Hopefully you uh, enjoyed this. I know I did. It was really fun to go through these. And uh, I look forward to what Imprint is doing in the future. They've announced things like uh, The Wicker Man and The Warriors in a really wonderful box set with both the theatrical and director's cut. And I think that that's the first time, well, the second time. The, the theatrical Warriors apparently was available on a... German Blu-ray, but this is going to be, uh, I think, a little easier to get. Um, and just going to be a nice box set with extras. So that's a few things they have coming in the upcoming months, but go check out imprintfilms.com over at Via Vision Entertainment. I'm sorry, it's Via Vision Entertainment. Just look up Imprint Films. It'll take you to the Via Vision site and the Imprint Films section and see what they've got coming because it's very exciting stuff. Now, if you're worried about Im importing these, uh, you can get them through import CDs, Diabolic DVD tends to get them. You can also get them through Amazon. They are a little bit more expensive, but in my mind, the uh, amount of effort going into these discs makes it worthwhile for the most part. And so definitely just keep an eye on imprint. That would be my advice. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for watching or listening, and uh, have a wonderful week. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.